everyone, Brian Beeler, and welcome to the Storage Review Podcast. We're on site in lovely Denver, Colorado, snowy Denver, Colorado, at uh, Quantum's office. We're in their executive briefing center. And I've uh, stumbled across a uh, good friend, Dave Russell from Veeam. Dave, welcome. Hey, good to see you. And you're not kidding on the snowy day. It is a snowy day. And this is a fun conversation because we're sure. here at Quantum Shop yeah. and we're talking tape and we're yeah, talking yeah. backup and we're talking ransomware and all the things that you guys love to talk about. Yep. Um, Quantum's a good partner for, for Veeam. Veeam's a good partner for Quantum, I presume. I don't know what you guys do. But uh, um, what's, what's going on? What's the latest? Yeah, well, you know, as it relates to Quantum, like you say, good good partnership, you know, great infrastructure provider. We like to think we're a very good software provider. I mean, you need hardware and you need software. But as we saw from our video shoot today, you know, we can su suffice things like three, two, one rules, meaning three copies of your data, two different types of media, one off-site, and do that safely in a cyber threat world by both a combination of Veeam software and then what Quantum has done with some of their neat cybersecurity capabilities. Yeah, and we you're right, we did a, a video shoot earlier today where we went through a whole scenario yeah. of, of, of this and highlighting it in their tape libraries, and it's so cool. I think even as a practitioner, I, you're closer to it than I am, but we write about all this stuff and we use it in our lab, but then sometimes there's just that one level of disassociation from the actual gear or the actual solution. And seeing everything come together today was really sweet. And Quantum, for their part, they have all these protection layers that are available in their tape libraries. And they've got one level is to tell you, the backup software, that the tape is off to be removed when it's really still in the system and the application can't see it. Um, they've got all sorts of other stuff, but the one that I thought was so cool talking about ransomware is this ransom block solution yeah. where the uh, the cartridge can be ejected just a little bit. Right, semi-ejected. Semi-ejected, a couple millimeters, so that the robot inside can still see that the tapes are there, so it can account for them and know what's there, but it can't grab them. Yep. So you've got a truly secure air-gapped uh, solution that can only be accessed by you, your application or any other uh, by physically reinserting that cartridge. It's pretty neat. Yeah, and to your point, you have to physically be there, so you have to be on site, you mm -hmm. have to get through perimeter security. Even if you have you know, executive admin credentials, you can't get in there via root. You mm -hmm. could have super user, anything you can imagine, right? But you actually have to be in the room. So to your point though, it's, they demonstrated a quantum, three different layers of yep. additional security above like role-based access, other things. Beam certainly has a number of different layers we can write in an encrypted format as well. Mm -hmm. But if you combine all of these, what you're really trying to do is just close as many holes as is humanly possible, while as we saw, not reducing access or decreasing the ease. Mm -hmm. Well, ease of use was huge. Um, the the GUI that Quantum has is, is really simple and easy to use, which is not historically always been the case right. for Tate products. Uh, the Veeam uh, application obviously is easy. We use it in our lab, backing up a couple hundred VMs. It's been dead simple for a long time. Um, but just to think about the engineering of this little clasp in an arm that the robot can come over and actuate to kick out that uh, cartridge is, is pretty slick. Um, so yeah, I mean, innovation at tape is, is still very much a thing. Absolutely, I mean, we're on LTO9 now, is the most recent generation, and you know what you can store there in the palm of your hand for far less than even $100. It was at 30, 32 terabytes? A little above that, compressed, right? Yeah. It's 18 raw, and you get two and a half times compression on top of that, okay. so you know, literally for what you spend to go out to dinner with just you and your wife, now you can have that much data safely tucked away. And hey, you know where I go with my Hey, wife. I've heard. Well, I know you're cheap, so <laughs> that's what I've heard anyway. But you know, the, the great thing is, is you can enjoy all the different kinds of media types, mm -hmm. right? We, we did through our demonstration, we went to disk first, and then we went to tape. There's a scenario where you can also invoke the cloud, which sure. by the way, could have disk and probably tape underneath on mm -hmm. the back end of that too. All of these media types have their place just like all the different protection mechanisms combined to have a really secure environment, they have their place too. Well, you've got uh, thousands of customers using cloud, right? I'm, I'm sure maybe yep. even many, many, tens of yes. thousands. You've, most of them probably are. But one of the things that stood out to me is when we were looking at bringing those VMs back from tape, 
is the performance of tape. So that's not yeah. often a thing that's talked yeah, yeah. about, but we were at like 110, 115 megabytes per second dragging that stuff back in, and it was actually faster than the underlying disk. Yeah, and that's right. But that's also the beauty of software, right? Because if it was, you know, the Brian and Dave show here, we may not be able to afford the Cadillac infrastructure, sure. right? However, if you want to give us the highest performing quantum gear and the highest performing disk tape networking and server right. associated with that, obviously we're going to go faster. But it's a case of being software defined. We can operate on any infrastructure you give us. And that mm -hmm. can change over time. Welcome to the pandemic. You may not be able to afford it, meaning new gear, or if you can afford it, you may not be able to get it. We're getting it is the, is right? the thing. So the other thing that strikes me about the performance that we were seeing, would, again, is not the lead story for tape, but is when you optimize the workload for the media, there's something to be said there. For your cloud customers that have to go to the cloud for a backup, bringing all that back data back on site can be problematic. What What's going on there when you think about having to restore from cloud to on-prem infrastructure? Yeah, and it depends on the scenario, right? If it's a, the typical daily operational recovery, you're bringing down a file, maybe it's an application or a server. It's maybe not the cyber scenario where you're bringing back the entire data center. Right. If you are bringing back the entire data center, there's still an actual use case to say, let's drop ship something. Let's put it on a series of tapes. And, you know, FedEx yeah. that or pick your carrier of choice, right, and physically transport that. There's an old saying, you know, you, you can't beat the, the latency of, you know, FedEx, right? Uh, it's a gray beard in a uh, station wagon, isn't it? It's exactly. <laughs> whatever, pick whatever. a truck access method or something like that. But it goes mm -hmm. back to this repeating theme, right? All these capabilities and technologies have their place in the hierarchy. Well, yeah, and the tape has been so maligned from time to time, right? But I think we, what I've seen today and, and being on site running around in the uh, the data center behind us, but also their other data centers and labs, is that the capabilities of, of these these robots and the, the density of these cartridges just really can't be beat as part of your overall data plan and data uh, infrastructure. Yeah, and I like that you mentioned density because that's the amazing thing. As we saw on the tour, right, you've got essentially a spindle mm -hmm. with a standard rack size, you can now get enormous number of petabytes in something that's smaller than the refrigerator in our house. Yeah, and it's interesting too because most of what we've seen today are libraries that are half full or maybe you know, two thirds or whatever, but the ba other bays can be used right. to basically hide the tapes from applications so that they're still highly available in the right scenario and the right permissions for the robot to go see it and move it and, and give it back to the application. But the need to physically extract the tapes and send them off to uh, yes. a secure location for uh, protection, long-term archive, may be less necessary these days than it had been historically, especially when you layer in the cloud element as your, as your one part of your off-site bit, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. You could electronically vault to the cloud right. without having to physically hire a cartridge service like Iron Mountain is but one example, right? Mm -hmm. Where someone used to come by in the morning, physically take things to another location. It seems arcane by today's standards, well, doesn't and it? And speaking of today, so what's, what could be happening today? You could be literally be stuck on the freeway, mm -hmm. and that's a real-world possibility. So you could keep your tape library on-prem, electronically vault off-prem, mm -hmm. also have a faster tier if you want, like maybe SSD. All those things, you layer up all those in combination, and now you can get the price benefit performance that a business is looking for. Yeah, and the reliability and availability and all the other illities that you, that you need right. if you're gonna operate a data center, right? Yeah. So what are you guys seeing in terms of what Veeam customers are doing? I mean, what we're talking about is maybe a best of breed solution where you're doing you know, your application level backups, you're doing your snapshots on your storage, you're, you've got a backup target, you've got a tape repository, you've got a cloud. So that's kind of like the, the grade A, right, you know, right. deepest and bestest. Um, but that's not always practical or affordable or maybe even necessary. Maybe at the edge you can drop some of those steps but still ha have good protection. Just what are you seeing thematically in, in Veeam customers yeah, you know, I think it depends a little about where they're at in their asset management life cycle. Meaning, at myself, I've gone essentially all flash at home. I have, I think, one eight terabyte HDD, everything else is flash. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, well, 
at my kind of scale, I can afford that. It's not actually not that you know much of a cost differential. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you've already made an investment in something, you've already made an investment in tape. You know, one of the cool things I liked about you know, Ransom Block feature is that's not unique to the latest, greatest generation of LTO nine tape drive. Right. Right. That's something that we retrofitted in the existing library, any generation of LTO drive. So, you know, if you've already invested in something, great, get the useful life out of that. That's what I always yeah. tell people. Don't, don't have a solution that forces you not only to go buy that software, but then mandates a specific kind of infrastructure. So going back to your original question, you know, what are we seeing? It's really A to Z. I mean, 430,000 customers now in over 180 countries. There's not just one of everything. There's a thousand of everything. Well, you've got everything from someone running community edition in their home lab to yeah. fortune 100 or you know whatever running it in an organization so obviously yeah. you can't one size fits all that but, but but literally to that point so the very same instance of the veeam backup and replication server that i'm right. running on this lenovo laptop one instance of vbr beam backup and replication we've got a major bank protecting 19,000 vms eight petabytes of data one instance, but the difference, same software, same right, bits, right. but it's running on substantially different infrastructure. With all those stickers on that system's lid, how do you know it's a Lenovo? I, it, I was told. It's, it's, <laughs> it's got, I got a Lenovo it's sticker right here. <laughs> you can see it on, on, the, uh, on the wrist pad. Yeah. Uh, I kind of uh, threw Edge out there as we were talking. That's one of the, the big thematic things that we're hearing from infrastructure. Uh, providers, whether it's analytics at the edge, yeah. and NVIDIA's got a, a nice story about what they're doing there. There's so many hyper-converged solutions. There's all kinds of things that are trying to eliminate cost at the edge. So switchless configurations seem to be coming back around, a server direct attached to storage and, and, and all sorts of other things. What do you see at the edge from a Veeam perspective? I'd be kind of interested to see how data protection at the edge is maybe different or, or moving, uh, whether it's retail or smart industrial or branch banks, you know, there's... Yeah, so I like that you mentioned it kind of by vertical or use case, right? right? Because in some cases, it's almost like big data. Do you care about all of the individual elements or do you care about the answer? Mm -hmm. So same with the edge, you know, do you need all of those bits like retail? You actually do. You need every transaction because someone's going to return yeah, something right. or you need to know inventory, right? Mm -hmm. In other cases, maybe all you really needed to know was the end result in that car. You care about what was the fuel consumption or the average of something, right? Right. Not all the data points. So in some cases, you know, you need to protect everything out there. In other cases, basically, there, you see an aggregation point and you just grab the result and you bring it back to the regional data center, primary data center. So it's in all of the above, just depending on what the scenario is. So what's coming? What's going on out there? Either happening naturally or because of COVID or whatever, what what has Veeam had to do recently to be responsive to something new or different? Or maybe nothing's changed and just the, the placement of data has changed a little bit. Yeah, you know, all of the above, you know, some things have changed. So for example, we accelerated our Mac client because work from home kind of happened okay. seemingly overnight, you know. Quite um, literally for, for yeah. millions of people, right? Yeah, I mean, even for Veeam, you know, there was within a couple of weeks, all the offices were shut down. And not everyone was working remotely, so people had to come and get gear and go now back to their home. And some of those people are running Macs, as were you know our, some of our customers. So accelerated the Mac agent, okay. get that out and about. Accelerated the cloud heavily, mm -hmm. you know. So instead of investing in new infrastructure, in some cases you literally couldn't get into the data center to rack and stack. So we saw people go to the cloud heavier than probably they planned to. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, thinking about asset management, you know, you look behind us all that, if, if we had invested in that, we're not turning that off. Mm -hmm. So it became yeah. an and situation, okay. right? So you have to be able to cover A to Z. And I think that's appropriate, right? You shouldn't be forced to decommission something to make this leap. Right. Well, I mean, a lot of the leaps are going to the cloud, which we've talked about a couple mm -hmm. times here. I was at uh, reInvent this year. Yeah. I think you were kicking around there, there too. What, What's uh, what's your feeling on on Veeam's stance on where the appropriate fit is in the cloud? Do you see cloud as a low cost repository for Veeam? Do you see Veeam obviously backing up uh, virtualization in the cloud? But then there's this, also this element with Amazon. I mean, they've got their own backup services. It's sort of a, a frenemy situation there. Like. 
how do you categorize your cloud initiatives and then where do you have the best strength? Yeah, well, a lot to unpack there. I know, that's a big question. A couple different things. Um, I mean, I'll hit like the frenemy one. You know, co-opetition is everywhere, but you can think about that like literally now 20, almost 25 years ago, Windows had a built-in backup client mm -hmm. associated with it. And then later on, NT backup and mm -hmm. et cetera, a data protection manager on through the, you know, other operating systems, now cloud systems, obviously VMware and other hypervisors have capabilities mm -hmm. and that's, that's totally fine. You know, where a third party comes into play is, do you want some capabilities, be it application integration, auditing, infrastructure integration like storage arrays, or do you want to be able to run multi-cloud, multi-hypervisor? So there's value add to be brought to the table, in other sure. words, but there's real value, we understand, in each of those individual providers providing some capability as well. Mm -hmm. So room to exist. Everyone's got to protect data, so we're not worried about that. Now, in terms of you know what's the right fit, I, again, it's a bit of a it depends. I definitely think we've seen acceleration, meaning more things born in the cloud, more for things sure. lift yeah. and shift to the cloud. But for most of us, it hasn't been a decommission the data center and turn on everything in the cloud. Most of those efforts have not gone well from well, and people that the, we talked. They to. haven't right, and because the cloud's not a charity, right? You know, so it's not inherently <laughs> less expensive, not. and not always available. I mean, there's seen a number of availability hits, not just at AWS, but everywhere. I mean, it's it's a reality, right? Yeah, you know, and I, I want to be fair on that because it certainly seems like it's big news whenever a hyperscaler has a hiccup. To be fair, if you think about how many data centers that represents, mm -hmm. you know, the, the probability is still very favorable, but to your point, it, it can happen. Well, if it happens to you, it's like car accidents happen every day, but we still drive, right? Right, yeah. As go. long as it doesn't happen to you, then it's like, mm, it's, it's all okay. Yeah. But the one time that you're stuff in your zone, yeah, I know, it's a but, challenge. But that actually speaks to why, you know, having control over your data and maybe having the ability to move that to a secondary location, mm -hmm. whether that's even repatriating it back on-prem or to another cloud provider or just another region, all makes sense. You may not want to do that with all of your data. But certain key applications, maybe. Yeah. Oh, I think that's a pretty interesting um, concept that I think will be happening more, is that if you've got an on-prem data center, you're running your stuff, Maybe we do DR to the cloud, so we can spin up there if we need to, or if you're gonna run in the cloud, then there's a lot of cross-cloud issues there of, of data transport, so how do I back up to GCP or Azure or, yeah. or, or, or another zone within AWS or whatever it is so that I have better availability coverage? And you guys can help with a lot of that too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we write in a portable data format. We can go from on-prem to cloud, back, cloud A to cloud B, back. So whatever the case may be. So if you think about what backup does, it essentially grabs data, ingests data, mm -hmm. manage it, tracks metadata, and then writes it somewhere. So operationally, it's been backup and recovery in case someone makes a mistake or maybe a component fails, those things happen pretty infrequently. Right. Now comes cyber, unfortunately, that could make, now mean 100% of our data is at risk and all at once today, right. not over a period of years. Let's change the game, right, from, hey, I deleted this Excel sheet, IT guy, could you help me go do file recovery and get it back? To, to all that's gone. Yeah, to that's all <laughs> compromised. Right. And that's problematic, and it's a totally different scale. So, you know, it also gets me thinking that so many orgs have I don't know what the stat is, you probably have it more at hand, but something like seven backup applications in, in a large environment, or some, some silly number. Yeah. It's not one. Right, right. How is that even sustainable? I mean, I'm sure you would like to have all of it be Veeam, right? But how is, how is it sustainable to have five, six, seven backup apps? Yeah, and I think not just in backup, but overall, right, standardization and collapse the tool set. We were chatting earlier with the quantum folks about, and from an engineering perspective, right. wanting to reduce the component tree set because maybe you can't get that transistor, you know, things of that nature. Well, the to your pieces, point, yeah. yeah, the hardware pieces. To your point, 
if this was the Brian and Dave shop, do we want to train on five different applications of anything? Forget backup. No, like we, we no really you wouldn't don't. want five databases either. And we went to our purchasing department and they would say, wait a minute, we're not going to get economies of scale right. by doing that either. You're assuming we have a purchasing department or a little this company? Brian and Dave company is pretty big. <laughs> well, it sounded kind of janky earlier when you were, <laughs> when you were We're up to three about, people now. <laughs> yeah, the, two of us <laughs> in a One's in HR a and there's you and me. I'm like, we're not hiring HR first. <laughs> anyway, okay, so not economies of scale, but I mean, just how does that exist? I mean, you guys, in the old days, you guys used to be the rogue backup application right. because the virtualization guy could swipe a credit card for nine bucks a month or you know, whatever, some number, and start using it to back up their, for their virtualized stuff. And, and that's pretty cool. And that, that's but honestly, cool. that play, that sales motion hasn't gone away. That still exists you know, on some scale today for Veeam. Mm -hmm. And we have about 67,000 enterprise customers, if you define enterprise, a thousand employees and right. above. But what does that mean? That's over a third of a million smaller, or less than a thousand customers. So that transactional, maybe it's a departmental buy, it might be a Fortune 500 company, but it's a, yeah, I can go swipe a credit card and download that now. That still happens. Yeah. And actually, I, I'm supposedly the VP of enterprise, right? <laughs> but I am okay with that because you know what that means is that's essentially a paid proof of concept, a paid POC. Yeah. Someone gets to know Veeam, likes Veeam, and says, you know what, I'm going to go suggest rolling that out now to whatever, to the Denver data center, the Bristol data center, on and on and on. Well, you guys have parlayed that nine bucks a month into what some a billion dollar company now, or or some number. I've I only get a fraction of that, but yeah, I'm told <laughs> it's that. it's it's a good number. Eh, you know that works. Um, so why but why do you think there's not more consolidation in data centers around backup apps specifically? Well, I think there's been friction. Part of the friction has been I wrote in a proprietary format, and now how do I go and yank that out? Okay. Or do I need to yank that out is maybe a bigger question. And the other part of that's been, well, I've been trained on something or we had to write scripts around something. So, so it gets embedded into the it, process. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, one of the things we like about Veeam, and I think the best compliment I would give is Dan here at Quantum said I've been using Veeam for about three days and I was able to figure it out. It kind of works. I'd give him the, the back compliment, you know, of we saw the media manager for that scalar library I've never touched a scalar library before today, but I could understand it intuitively mm -hmm. right away. That's not true with every bit of infrastructure, every uh, bit that's of backup a fair point. software. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. So, as you continue to grow the application, I know you're not the application developer, uh, even though you do dabble with uh, with with the application itself. What does Veeam have to do to keep relevant and keep growing? Because you guys got the backup and recovery thing that's been figured out for a number of years. I know historically it's been integrations with uh, your partners yeah. and storage providers to get in at a native level with uh, some Dell arrays and HP and other, and other partners. But where, where do you have to go to keep growing? Well, I don't think we stop. Certainly you know what I mean? Not, it's like, yeah. yeah, you keep that main engine going. To your point, it's, it's 1.1 plus billion dollars. So you don't want Oh, you threw in the, what, the point one. Yeah, okay. yeah, don't cheat me. <laughs> so, you know, we want to keep that engine going. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, just pausing on that. If it's, you know, picks, pick anyone's numbers you want, which are largely either Gartner or IDC. Mm -hmm. Let's conservatively say that's a $7 billion a year software only market on-prem. Okay. Obviously, a lot more room to go take share. And let's mm -hmm. face it, it's a take share business, but Veeam has been taking share for a while. You mean there's not a data center out there that's a greenfield opportunity with no backup application? Not for long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but you know, you keep that motion going. So mm -hmm. now to your point, well, where does the next wave come from? So that's in part, expand your surface of what you can sure. protect. So Salesforce is what we're expanding into, we've announced. We're getting, we've already got a beta right now of RHV, meaning Red Hat mm -hmm. Virtualization. Mm -hmm. So more, that's kind of a horizontal workload expansion. Okay. Now let's go back to that notion of, well, backup is really just a data movement engine. Mm -hmm. What else can you do with that? What else can you move? Right, well, and for what purpose? Okay. So that's where I could foresee future integrations and partnerships where someone may want that data, but they don't necessarily want to invest in the mover. So it's a bit like, I don't want to go buy the car, I want to rent the car. We happen to be the car that helps transport. So you want to be two men in a truck? Depending on the cost, yeah. 
<laughs> lower cost uh, alternative but right, for, for that. We've, we've perfected getting bits, moving bits, preserving bits, and playing well with the infrastructure and ecosystem involved in between. I, I know um, Veeam is your thing. Kasten's doing all right, too, yeah. in terms of picking up these new container-based workloads. What's the, the latest there to the extent? I don't know how, honestly, how deep you are in, in the Kasten world. No, so that's another, it's a good example, right, of trying to basically do the same play over again, only it's a little different. Mm -hmm. I mean, the different part is it's a different constituency. Instead of what starts. More application guys. That's right. It, you know, it's more the DevOps person, the application yeah. person versus, you know, the VM stuff that started Veeam was really a, initially a server administrator because it wasn't such thing as a virtualization administrator yeah, yet. Right. And then that became a little more mainstream into the rest of the infrastructure team. Now we can take that same notion of, well, yeah, you're still doing the same thing, getting the bits, managing them, and storing them, but for a different use case, like right. you said. Now it's application development, or it's migration. Develop on-prem, want to go production in cloud. Yeah. So, and you would like to have protection built into that, either disaster recovery or backup, but offer that to someone who doesn't wake up thinking that that's my primary role. My primary role is I need to deliver this new payroll application or whatever it may be, this new CRM tool. Yeah. But I want the safety that comes along with this without having to major in that. If I have a solution, Kasten in this case, that can help me with this new development environment, but give me those kind of services that I need, great. Well, it's got to help IT too, because ultimately they bear some responsibility in these hard to wrangle workloads or maybe difficult to understand because it's not traditional yeah. IT. There's some conflict there at times, but if they see, hey, I use Veeam here and we can use Cast in here and get to the same place with these emerging workloads or these born in the cloud or however you want to categorize them, that's got to be comforting to the traditional backup architects and, and such, I would think. Yeah, and you know, I always tell the traditional, you know, the on-prem backup person, you know, don't close your eyes to emerging workloads, whether that's born in the cloud or containers. And containers are roughly halfway on-prem, half in the cloud, but it's a different constituency. Like you were saying, it's yeah. an application owner, but the application owner still would like to have that same level of protection availability and the data movement that kind of a solution can provide. So if you're the on-prem backup person, great, go embrace a tool set that integrates into new workloads and new use cases. And it's not so dissimilar from say, you know, back in the day, the Oracle administrator, sure. you know, wanted to also protect data, wanted to have that at their control, but didn't want to major in backup. Mm -hmm. Well, because before it was complicated, right? Well, and you want to reduce the friction. You want to reduce the barrier to entry for, for providing these data services, because best practices are still best practices. You know, I want to capture this, move this, preserve this, manage it appropriately, put it on the right infrastructure at the right time, those types of things. So something else Veeam's been really good at historically is, you, you guys have done a, an amazing job of creating passionate customers, and I'm not sure, I think that gets reflected maybe in your NPS score, and I know you guys monitor a bunch of other uh, uh, things. But by having things like the community edition yeah. out there, by enabling what we see at Storage Review is we like to give away a lot of gear. So if we get a server in and once we can't use it anymore and if the Dell or whoever doesn't want it back, we'll give it away. And we'll go to Home Lab on Reddit, we'll give it away on our social channels, hard drives, SSDs, whatever. And the community of people out there either young kids that are coming up through high school or college programs that want to get their own little home lab startups or older people that want to reskill or upskill or whatever that maybe they're maybe they're sysadmins but they don't have containers at, right. at at work but they want to get some gear and put it put together some environments at home you guys have been supportive in that way by uh, community edition mm -hmm. right on the beam side and I think kasten has got a similar yep. trial or, or, or free tier Talk about that just for a second and how important. I mean, we talked about it a little bit already, but it seems to me that it's something that's really important that shouldn't be underplayed in terms of the, the overall company. I totally agree on a number of different fronts. You know, one of it is on the individual level, you know, it, it becomes a win-win, meaning let's say someone, like to your point, they're up and coming, they, they can't afford a license of some tool, or they want to retool themselves. They've yeah. been in the industry a while. Yeah. Great, go download something at no charge and it serves a purpose. 
What does Veeam get out of that? Well, a couple things. We get now people that train themselves yeah. on our, we'd like to think, easy to use technology, but they learned it and know now how to utilize it best all on their own. Well, yeah, I mean, when, and then when it pops up in at work or when they right. grow into something, maybe they go get a cert, or at least it's not scary when they're confronted that, with that's it, That's right? right, they understand how to use it, and we also get product input. So we actually allow people to register on our forums and give feedback. Mm -hmm. I like this, I don't like this, this didn't work. Hey, have you guys thought of doing this new feature request? So we get also this new bed of people to try to tell us how can we can Broad improve the, the product. Audience, yeah. And there's over one million downloads of the solution running in the wild out there. It's pretty strong. And so that sort of openness, and I guess the responsiveness too, you're talking about with the forums, is part of what makes your, your people passionate about, about Veeam, which is pretty cool. I mean, it must be fun to see. That gets expressed uh, a lot through events. So you've got yeah. a Veeam on event that you guys yeah. have done six years, five years, something. I remember being at the very first one. I was at the first one. Yeah, <laughs> As, Aria. Yeah, right, yes. Um, Aria. Which was where we're going back. Okay, so talk about that, because you've yeah. got your event, Veeamon, coming up this, yeah. this spring? When yeah, it's it? coming up in May. So the current realities are what they are, which is we're gonna have a hybrid event. Mm -hmm. We will return back in person. We will go to Las Vegas, but it will be hybrid. And I like that personally because it's not, flexible. It's flexible. Maybe some people can't travel because of their country or their may company. Not even, you may not be legal or you may not be allowed back. That's right. <laughs> once That's you, right. It's, so, a, it's a changing target too. Right. right. Well, it's changing, meaning, yeah, to many ways it's evolving. Someone could say, I could travel today, but maybe by May I cannot. Right. So it, it offers us an opportunity to reach even more people, which is always positive. That's always goodness. But it also allows people that can return on site. You mentioned AWS right. reInvent. Mm -hmm. You know, it was... People that were there obviously wanted to be there, but there was a buzz about it, like we're back. There's a, there's a theme. I mean, we did uh, Super Compute, we did AWS, and then of course we're doing events like this, just small on, yep. on site things. But you're right, the people that are at these shows want to be there. No one, because everything's harder, travel's harder, yeah. it's more uncomfortable, it's the masking on the plane. I mean, it's not insurmountable, but it does raise the pain in the butt level a little bit, right? Sure. Um, so yeah, if you're willing to do that and your company will let you go or sponsor you to go or whatever, then yeah, you want to go and, and kick some butt while you're there. And we're seeing tremendous enthusiasm. And so I would expect come May that the, the people that are on site are, are going to be jacked up for this thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really excited because you know we do tend to have a pretty passionate base like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think those that are there are going to be really euphoric. I don't yeah. know, probably the best word I would describe it, right? They maybe, wanna be there. Maybe a little aggressive, but okay. <laughs> but they've waited years. I know. They've waited years, and they're they're excited now to get right, back. Right, so you missed two, right? Let's see. Yes. I've totally lost track of time, but uh, yeah, yeah, last year, obviously, and then 20. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that'll be fun. And one of the things, too, for people that are looking to grow skills, you guys do a ton of training and yeah. classes and certs. Free and online capabilities. I mean, there's formalized yeah. programs, yeah, yeah. but there's you can click a couple mouse strokes and go start training yourself on this for free and to what we talked about earlier, download a perpetually free version. It's not mm -hmm. gonna time bomb out in 60 days or something right. like that. No, it's pretty strong. Um, and, and Veeam will have a responsible party, I'm sure, but Veeam parties are... Well, they always start off responsible. <laughs> That's the plan anyway. No, in a pandemic, I mean, it, it definitely will be I well know. well supervised. I mean, that's the thing, you know, that's what makes it tricky, actually. You know Rick Vanover, who was very instrumental in our events. The pandemic has layered on so many additional steps, you know, but that's what we need to do because we need to do it safely. We need to respond to evolving, changing world mm -hmm. in terms of what are the requirements and restrictions and caveats and also respond to those that can't come or choose not to come. That's fine too. Yeah, well then you're gonna deliver the online component yep. for them and off you go. Uh, is it online, is it free still this year? Yeah. All right. So, and you know, what I like about that actually is, what I think is neat is we have the ability to have people monitoring that. So you can ask a question you're in real isolated. time. Yeah. yeah. So you don't, and you also don't have to wait till the very end to rush the stage. Oh, I need to go get to Brian before he leaves because I have this burning question. You right. can ask that in real time and we'll have people in addition to the speaker monitoring that and be able to get back to you. Drop a URL or say, hey, can I follow, Can I get your contact info? We'll follow right. up on that. All right. 
Well, that's cool. I appreciate you guys. You know, you guys doing this. You coming down? I know it's a short, a shorter drive for you than flight for us, but that's still cool. And this uh, this setup is is pretty slick. So it's fun, very slick. Fun yeah. to be in in Quantum's office and, and checking this stuff out. Yeah, no, they were absolutely great hosts today. So I appreciate them having us and appreciate chatting with you as always. Yeah, you hit those Fritos pretty good, didn't you? Yeah, well, and five bags in the backpack <laughs> and all the LTO tape drives I could be able to crank yeah. out of here. All right, thanks for tuning in. Bye bye.